In this lecture, we'll be discussing ZMC fracture repair. I'll describe my surgical techniques I have refined over performing hundreds of these in the last 10 years. We'll invite you to consider incorporating some of these techniques to further enhancing your surgical outcomes and minimize complications. We'll start out by looking at relevant surgical anatomy to help you avoid complications. We'll then identify key visual references that will tell you that your bone reduction is correct. We'll also describe how to efficiently approach the fracture site and different methods of reducing the fracture and discuss optimal plating sequence of the fracture sites and plating techniques. Here's a typical ZMC fracture and the ZMC fractures involve four suture sites, namely zygomatical maxillary suture, zygomatical sphenoid suture, zygomatical farnal suture, and zygomatical temporal suture lines. Zygomatical maxillary and the zygomatical frontal suture lines make up a vertically oriented major support called lateral maxillary buttress. It's also commonly referred to as zygomatical maxillary buttress. One of the goals with the repair is to restore structural support to the face by repairing the lateral buttress. Contrastingly, the zygomatic arch and the infrabital rim consist of a minor support commonly referred to as upper transverse maxillary buttress. Restoring structural support along the minor support system is not as crucial as restoring the vertically oriented major support system. In a typical ZMC fracture, you have impact that occurs at the malar eminence. The impact will cause telescoping of the ZMC fracture into the maxillary sinus in an inferior and medial direction. The bone displacement can cause several issues. In particular, the zygomatic arch segment can be depressed, causing coronoid compression and trismus. Also, as the malar eminence segment collapses in, it can lead to orbital floor fracture, which can lead to diplopia. And lastly, depressed malar eminence can cause narrowing of the facial width and cause facial asymmetry. And these are commonly considered as three surgical indications for ZMC repair. One exception to this rule is the facial asymmetry, which may not be a factor in certain individuals or in the elderly who does not care as much about cosmesis, where this may be a relevant surgical indication in the younger population who may be bothered by the facial cosmetic changes. Relevant anatomy to note is infrabital nerve. It's commonly identified during part of the subperiosteal dissection, and you can see the nerve exiting the infraorbital foramen as you approach the infraorbital rim. The fracture line will commonly involve the infraorbital foramen. Lateral canthus may be encountered during dissection of the lateral orbital rim. It may need to be reattached if there is a sign of detachment. The frontal branch of the facial nerve travels posterior to the lateral orbital rim and may be encountered during surgical approach. Tooth roots may also be encountered and is generally assumed to be twice the height of the crown. So key references are something that's not commonly described, and this is what I generally use to ensure that the bony reduction is satisfactory. Along the lateral vertical buttress, this curvature along the zygomatical maxillary buttress is key visual reference that you want to restore. Higher up along the lateral vertical buttress is the zygomatical frontal suture line. In this area, the curvature of the lateral orbital rim along its anterior and posterior aspect is a key visual reference that we attempt to restore. And because lateral orbital rim is thick bone, this area is typically well preserved, even in severe trauma. As a result, this is typically where I'll start the plating process. Another key reference is the infraorbital rim. The fracture line superior and inferior to the infraorbital foramen can be checked for bony reduction. Last key reference is the anterior maxillary sinus wall. You'll note that initially along the fracture line that the two planes are sitting in different depth. And as the bone gets reduced properly, the maxillary sinus wall will come into the same plane, confirming that the bone is in proper reduction. One of the commonly asked questions regarding ZMC is what is the most accurate suture line to use as a reference to ensure that the bone is reduced? And the answer is zygomatical sphenoid suture line. However, it's important to note that this location is intraorbital and it's not practical to be used as a visual reference. So general overview of the repair steps is the following. You're going to expose all existing fractures using intraoral incision, lateral brow incision, 
plus or minus transconjunctival incision. You then want to reduce the grossly displaced fractures. Now, once it's reduced, you want to confirm proper reduction at the lateral buttress marked by zygomedical maxillary suture line and the fracture located next to the zygomedical frontal suture line. If you have a situation where you have disruption of the dental occlusion, that you want to start out by doing maxillomandibular fixation to restore pre-morbid occlusion. And this would be applicable if you have concurrent mandible fracture or Lafort fracture. Once the MMF restores pre-morbid occlusion and you have proper reduction of the bone, you can then start plating. And this is a common ZMC plating configuration for relatively simple ZMC without significant combination. Next, we'll discuss various surgical approach used in ZMC repair. If you have a pre-existing laceration, you want to consider using them if it's overlying the fracture site. You may also have to consider adding additional approach to gain adequate exposure. In situation without pre-existing laceration, you can use intraoral maxillary vestibular approach and lateral brow approach. Now you can replace this with a more cosmetically pleasing upper blepharoplasty approach. This approach may be beneficial in younger patients with sensitivity to cosmesis. In cases where there's much more severity involving the malar eminence and orbital floor component, you want to combine the intraoral maxillary approach with the lateral brow approach and combine that with transconjunctival approach with or without the lateral canthotomy. Now, when thinking about surgical approach, I like to think of them unique to each location where the fracture is occurring. If you're attempting to access a fracture located at the zygomedical maxillary suture line that extends up to the infraorbital rim, you can use an intraoral maxillary vestibular approach. In this approach, I leave about two millimeter mucosal cuff for closure, and then I'll dissect in the subperiosteal tissue plane and continue that dissection until I reach the infraorbital rim and lateral maxillary buttress curvature. As you approach the infraorbital rim, you identify the infraorbital nerve as it exits the infraorbital foramen. And out laterally, as you're exposing the lateral maxillary buttress curvature, you want to avoid exposing the buccal fat pad. Next, we'll discuss accessing the zygomatic arch. Now, this is a typical representation of the type of zygomatic arch fracture you may get. You may have a non-displaced zygomatic arch fracture. You may have a zygomatic arch fracture that has displaced medially, causing possibly trismus from coronary compression. And you may have a zygomatic arch component that's depressed along with the ZMC fracture. Situations where you have displaced zygomatic arch fracture causing trismus you can use various methods to reduce the depressed zygomatic arch fragment. Transoral approach is helpful if there's concurrent displaced CMC that occurs along with the zygomatic arch fracture. Through the maxillary vestibular approach, you can insert Boise elevator or another type of elevator that you prefer, place this lateral to the lateral buttress and under the zygomatic arch. As you try to sweep it posteriorly, you'll note that the elevator will not sweep because a depressed zygomatic arch segment will prevent movement of the elevator. And as you elevate this fracture segment, you'll note that you'll be able to sweep back and forth, and that tells you that the zygomatic arch has been properly elevated. Another approach is use Gilly's approach. This approach is particularly helpful if you have an isolated zygomatic arch fracture without displaced ZMC fracture. Now, one thing to remember in this area is that the fascia that's directly overlying the temporalis muscle is called deep temporal fascia. To elevate the depressed zygomatic arch segment, you have to approach it from its deep aspect. As such, the plane of dissection is to remain deep to the deep temporal fascia while staying superficial to the temporalis muscle to reach the deep aspect of the zygomatic arch segment to lift it superficially. So here's a typical patient. I'll generally mark out the lateral canthus and tragus, and I draw a straight line. And usually at halfway point, you'll note the frontal branch of the facial nerve traveling across to reach the frontalis muscle, as you can see on the right. 
And the scalp incision is created posterior to the temporal hairline in oblique fashion to mirror the frontal branch that's traveling. You want to cut through the skin and keep cutting down until you identify white, shiny, deep temporal fascia. Once you cut through the deep temporal fascia, you'll then see muscle layer, and this is your temporalis muscle. Once you're in this plane, you want to remain superficial to the temporal muscle to reach the zygomatic arch. And once you have Boise elevator at the level of the zygomatic arch, you attempt this sweep, and you'll note that you won't be able to sweep back and forth due to the zygomatic arch that's depressed. So once you elevate this by applying upper pressure, you will note that you will now be able to sweep anteriorly and posteriorly. And to summarize, you want to remain deep to the deep temporal fascia, superficial to the temporalis muscle to reach deep aspect of the zygomatic arch to lift it. Next, we'll discuss access to the lateral orbital rim near the zygomatic frontal suture line. So this is a commonly used approach, and cosmetically, it actually hides really well, especially if you can hide part of the incision in the lateral eyebrow region. So you want to mark out the lateral orbital rim curvature as shown in the white. If you can hide the superior part of the incision in the eyebrow, you can do so. And you want to center it along the zygomatic frontal suture line or at the side of the fracture, which may be palpable under the skin. Next, once you incise through that, palpate for the lateral orbital rim and avoid falling anterior to it into the orbit or posterior to it into the, towards the temporalis. You want to use blunt dissection, such as mosquito forcep, to dissect parallel to the orbicularis oculi muscle. And once you're at the periosteum, you want to cut through it to dissect within the subperiosteal tissue plane until the entire anterior and the posterior aspect of the lateral orbital rim is fully exposed. And visualizing this is key to ensure that you have visual reference to ensure bone reduction. Now, as you dissect along the anterior aspect of the lateral orbital rim, you want to be mindful of the lateral canthus. If it's already disinserted, you will need to reinsert that as shown in a different surgical video. Now, a variation to this that provides more cosmetically pleasing result is using an upper blepharoplasty approach. So this is maybe an option in the younger population. You want to start out by marking an upper blepharoplasty incision. Use a supratarsal crease, generally 10 millimeters above the central upper lid margin and 6 millimeters laterally as it curves down. You want to cut through skin and orbicularis oculi muscle. And you want to reach deep to the orbicularis oculi muscle. Now at this point, you want to pull the incision over towards the lateral orbital rim with a retractor. And as you do so, you will then dissect over the periosteum until you can reach the subperiosteal tissue plane. You want to expose the entire lateral orbital rim along the anterior and posterior aspect, as well as the zygomatic frontal suture site or the fracture site that's nearby. Next, we'll discuss an additional approach that will give you wider exposure around the orbital region. In particular, we'll be discussing transconjunctival approach with lateral canthotomy. In more severe impact, the malar eminence bone, which is very thick, can also fracture. So if you need a wider exposure at the malar eminence or the inferior part of the lateral orbital rim, which is also very thick bone, you'll probably need to gain additional exposure by using transconjunctival incision with the lateral canthotomy. And if you have a very large orbital floor defect, you can also use this approach. Lateral canthotomy is usually done first, and this is done so by cutting with the iris scissors towards the lateral orbital rim with one time inside the lower eyelid and the other on the outside of the lower eyelid. And once you cut through the lateral canthus, you then want to be within the wound itself and cut deep to the eyelid while you're cutting inferiorly to release the inferior limb of the lateral canthus. Or another way of saying that is lower eyelid portion of the lateral canthus. Now, once you release it sufficiently, this will allow the entire lower eyelid to swing inferiorly. 
This will give you good access to the inferior aspect of the lateral orbital rim. Now, if you need additional access, then you can combine this with transconjunctival incision. So transconjunctival incision is useful if you have malar eminence or orbital floor defect that needs to be repaired and allows lower eyelid to be mobilized further. For transconjunctival incision, you generally start up by injecting local for hemostasis while averting the lower eyelid. The incision is placed inferior to the lower eyelid tarsal plate. This is very important to avoid entropion or other complications. And before you make the incision, you want to sweep the orbital content posteriorly to expose the orbital rim. So there really shouldn't be much tissue that's present between the conjunctiva down to the infraorbital rim bone itself. The incision needs to be inferior to the tarsal plate. Immediately, do not extend past the punctum. And laterally, you want to connect it to the lateral canthotomy incision. Now, once you cut through the incision, you should be able to palpate for the bone. You're going to continue that section until you reach the bone. Once you reach the bone, you can identify subperiosteal dissection plane and sweep the orbital content back and connect it lateral to the lateral canthotomy if you need additional lateral exposure. Next, we'll discuss bone reduction techniques. Key visual references that we need to identify and correct is a lateral orbital rim, infraorbital rim, the lateral buttress curvature, and the anterior maxillary sinus wall along the fracture line. Your goal during bone reduction is to restore normal bone curvature seen in these key reference locations. Next, we'll discuss how to achieve bony reduction in badly displaced fracture. I'll generally use J-shaped male urethrodilator to reduce the bone fracture. You have a ZMC fracture like this. You're going to have an intraoral maxillary incision. You will note that the lateral buttress visual reference shows gross disruption of the lateral buttress curvature. As you dissect subperiosteally to reach the infraorbital rim, you identify the infraorbital nerve exiting the infraorbital foramen. And at this site, you also note that infraorbital rim, which is a key reference, is also disrupted. Through the lateral brow incision, you're going to check the lateral orbital rim, and you will note that the visual reference in this area is also malaligned. We're going to start up by focusing along the major structural support along the lateral buttress. And you do this by placing a J-shaped urethrodilator through the intraoral incision, point it away from the skull base. Your goal is to lift the ZMC malar eminence out of the maxillary sinus by lifting it anteriorly and laterally. You want to place a non-dominant hand on the patient's forehead. And with the head positioned directly under you, you want to lift the dilator uh, while having an overhand grip. With the head positioned directly under you, you want to think about lifting the ZMC segment by pulling your right hand towards your chest. Now, as you do so, you'll note that the, the key visual reference that we have talked about changes to a more normal configuration. Similarly, the anterior maxillary sinus wall across the fracture line will start lining up. And when you check at the lateral brow incision, you'll note that the lateral orbital rim also lines up, which is another key visual reference. Now, once you have the entire lateral buttress curvature and the lateral orbital rim visual reference showing good signs of reduction, you're now ready to plate. We'll discuss two other methods of achieving disimpaction of the ZMC segment. First is Carol Girard screw, which is placed through a transcutaneous incision the major downside is you're going to have a transcutaneous incision at the cheek. So the other option is to place a screw through the thick part of the malar eminence and use a right angle placed through the intraoral incision to lift it to your desired location. With that said, in my experience, using a urethrodilator placed intraorally has been worked in vast majority of time to achieve disimpaction. Next, we'll discuss hardware application. Whenever you start planning, you want to start out with your easiest fracture, which means less comminuted, with good exposure. These numbers signify a typical order in which I apply hardware. Generally, I'll start out my plating process at the zygomedical frontal suture fracture site. The reason for this is that the lateral orbit is a very thick bone, and even in severe impact, the integrity of this area is relatively well preserved, 
with good visual reference. So once you have good reduction at the ZF, you want to stabilize it by placing either a four hole or a six hole curvilinear plate using three or four millimeter monocortical screws. Now once you have secured this area, it provides an anchoring point and now you can further refine reduction at the zygomedical maxillary segment. Next area I'll typically focus on is zygomedical maxillary suture line along the lateral buttress curvature. The visual references in this area is the lateral buttress curvature, anterior maxillary sinus wall between the, the two fracture segments. You will note that one segment is pushed in compared to the other. And once it's properly reduced, the anterior surface of the maxillary wall should be at the even plane. Also, infraorbital rim located superior to the infraorbital nerve serves as an important key visual reference. When placing screw in this area, it's important to know which bone is thick versus thin for adequate screw placement. The central portion of the maxillary sinus wall that is marked out in orange has very thin bone and is not adequate for screw placement. In surrounding areas along the infraorbital rim, malar eminence, alveolar bone, and medial buttress, and the lateral orbital rim, you have thicker bone that is adequate for screw placement. So circling back, along this section, if you have good bone stock with minimal combination, you can generally use a L-shaped plate to repair this location. In a more severe impact, you will have comminution that occurs along the lateral buttress curvature along with missing anterior maxillary sinus wall. In this situation, I'll use a ladder plate to span the bone gap and provide structural integrity, and this will also allow skin to drape without it falling into the maxillary sinus. Now the third plate is typically placed along the infraorbital rim. Now what I want to mention is, in situations where you have good stability, you do not need to place additional plate. Now if you have a situation like this where you have more severe impact with more comminution, and after placing two plates, if you have excess mobility of the malar eminence that can be seen along the infraorbital rim, then it is beneficial to place another plate. Placing another plate along the infraorbital rim will connect the medial buttress to the lateral buttress and provide minor support as you restore a horizontal buttress. When you do place a plate here, you want to use a thin plate because the plate can be palpable due to the fact that lower eyelid is quite thin. You can place the plate either superior or inferior to the nerve. It's generally easier to place the plate along the inferior aspect if there's adequate bone stock present. Now, if you have a situation like this where the ZMC fracture has minimal comminution, and if you palpate for the malar eminence after placing two plates, and you notice minimal movement of the malar eminence segment, then it may not be beneficial to place a third plate along the infraorbital rim. The decision to place a third plate or not does require some clinical judgment that comes with experience and time. So if you're not sure, you can place a third plate. If you do so, use a thin plate to minimize plate being palpable and use visual reference along the infraorbital rim curvature to help you with the bony reduction. Last place you may potentially plate is a zygomatic arch. And in my experience, it's almost never beneficial to plate this location as long as you have proper reduction of the zygomatic arch to avoid trismus. So my recommendation is to not to plate the zygomatic arch. As long as you have good stability from these three plates, it is unnecessary to plate the zygomatic arch. And as mentioned before, Zygomatic arch is considered minor support to the face, so plating this area provides minimal benefit. And to plate this location require a large scalp incision using a hemicoral incision, which is a fairly large incision for minimal structural gain. In my experience, there's never been an issue of non-union from not plating this location. So you want to get into the habit of asking why you do particular things, what are the benefit and risk of doing a particular step, if it is unnecessary, you want to stop doing it to increase your efficiency and to minimize complication. In respect to bony reduction, you can use either Gilly's approach or intraoral keen approach. If it's isolated zygomatic arch, I'll generally do Gilly's approach. If the zygomatic arch displacement occurs in concurrence with malar eminence depression, then I'll use intraoral incision to lift the malar eminence using a urethrodilator then I'll then use a Boise elevator placed through the intraoral incision to lift the zygomatic arch segment.
Once you have properly elevated the zygomatic arch section, you should be able to feel it through the skin that the section has been elevated. And you should be also be able to sweep with an instrument back and forth along the zygomatic arch to the zygomatic root. If you notice that the zygomatic arch section keeps falling in, you can place a gel foam deep to the zygomatic arch to support it from falling down. And it will generally fuse in that location where it's reduced. For closure, for the intraoral maxillary incision, I'll use a 3 of Vicro. I'll use Dermabond to achieve watertight closure. For lateral brow incision, I'll use 4 of Vicro sutures and 5 of fast absorbing gut with Dermabond to provide additional support in this area. For a transconjunctival incision, most surgeons recommend not closing this incision. However, I was consulted on a case that had abnormal conjunctival incision healing that scarred in a way that resulted in entropion. Since then, I've been closing all my conjunctival incision using a 6-so fast absorbing gut suture. For lateral canthus incision, I'll suspend the lateral canthus using 4 clear nylon or 4 vicro, and then subdermal closure using 4 vicro that's buried, and skin closure with 5-o or 6-o fast absorbing gut suture. Next, we'll discuss commonly seen fracture patterns with ZMC and discuss different types of fracture pattern that affects surgical approach as well as surgical repair techniques. In type 1A, you have an isolated zygomatic arch depression that's pushing up against coronoid causing trismus. In that case, I'll use a Gillies approach to reduce the fracture. And as mentioned before, it's very rare for this area to require plating. In type 1B, you have concurrent ZMC fracture with displaced male eminence with zygomatic arch fracture that's also displaced. Because the ZMC fracture requires transor approach, the same transor approach can also be used to elevate the depressed zygomatic arch fracture. Once the zygomatic arch is properly elevated, you should be able to sweep the elevator back and forth. You do not need to plick the zygomatic arch. However, upon palpation, if you notice that there's excess movement, or tendency for the zygomatic arch segment to be displaced medially, you can place a gel foam to support it deep to the zygomatic arch and it will fuse in that location. The displaced ZMC fracture should also be repaired using a treatment algorithm that will be mentioned later. In type 1C, you have complex or comminuted zygomatic arch fracture. If you have a zygomatic arch fracture that are in multiple pieces and there's a tendency for it to be displaced medially despite reduction attempts, in that case, you want to open the fracture site and plate it to minimize medial displacement, which may result in coronary compression and resulting trismus. More commonly, you may have a zygomatic arch fracture that's occurring in combination with posterior aspect of the lateral orbital rim being fractured or the posterior aspect of the mela eminence being fractured that's not adequately accessible by using the lateral brow approach or the intraoral approach. In that situation, you need to consider using either hemicoronal or a bicoronal incision to gain adequate access to the zygomatic arch, as well as the lateral orbit and the malar eminence along the posterior aspect. Bicoronal incision is designed to follow along the preauricular crease. Anterior scalp flap is raised within the subperiosteal tissue plane until the supraorbital rim is reached. And also subperiosteal dissection is performed along the lateral orbital rim and along the zygomatic arch while preserving the frontal branch of the facial nerve. Once zygomatic arch fracture is properly exposed, if you have a concurrent ZMC fracture with involvement of the malar eminence, you should also focus on exposing that malar eminence segment by using additional intraoral incision or other indicated approaches. Once you have both the malar eminence part of the ZMC fracture and the zygomatic arch fracture both exposed, your primary focus should be on the malar eminence segment of the ZMC fracture first. This area should generally be reduced and plated first. And once that is complete, you can then focus on the zygomatic arch fracture segment. You can use a single long plate to secure multiple segments of zygomatic arch fracture into proper alignment. However, this may be more difficult than using multiple smaller plates to span the gap and stabilize a fracture. The downside of using multiple small plates is that you may not have sufficient bone surface area for proper screw placement.
Before closing the bicornal incision, it's best to place a drain to minimize the risk of hematoma formation. Type 2 is a simple displaced ZMC. In this case, we'll approach this fracture site using either lateral brow or upper blepharoplasty approach and intraoral maxillary vestibular approach. For plating, we'll place a four hole along the ZF suture line and an L plate along the zygomedical maxillary suture line. In situations with good bone stock and adequate stability being provided by two plates, you do not need additional plate along the infraorbital rim. However, if you notice there's excess movement of the malar eminence despite the two plates being placed, you want to place a third plate along the infraorbital rim. And as mentioned before, there's minimal benefit in plating the zygomatic arch when there's already stability being provided by three plates. In type 3 fracture, you have a comminution occurring along the lateral maxillary buttress. This is commonly seen in the elderly or the edentulous patient whose maxillary bone has thinned out over the years. The approach in this situation is very similar to type 2, using lateral brow and intraoral incision. Due to the presence of poor bone stock and a large bone gap that occurs along the anterior maxillary sinus wall, it makes plate and screw placement that much more difficult. In this situation, using a ladder plate provides greater stability as you are using two plates that are fused side by side. With limited thick bone present to accept screws, this type of plate gives you more options for screw placement. Lastly, it minimizes the risk of cheek skin falling into the maxillary sinus. And as seen in type 2, if you have persistent instability at the malar eminence, you can place additional plate along the infraorbital rim to provide additional support. There's no need to plate the zygomatic arch as you should have sufficient stability provided by the three plates. Type 4 has a fracture that occurs along the inferior aspect of the lateral orbital rim or the superior aspect of the malar eminence. What's significant about this location is that this is an inferior aspect of what's reachable through the lateral brow incision and the superior aspect of what's reachable through the intraoral maxillary vestibular approach. As a result, you need an additional approach consisting of lateral canthotomy with or without transconjunctival incision to gain adequate access by mobilizing the lower eyelid. And for hard replacement, you can consider plating the ZF and ZM section as you normally would. And then by using an additional approach, you can gain adequate access to plate across the inferior aspect of the lateral orbital rim. It's similar to type 2 and 3. If there's excess movement of the malar eminence, then you want to provide additional plate across the infraorbital rim to further stabilize the malar eminence. With type 5, you have subtotal orbital floor defect that becomes evident once the ZMC fracture is properly reduced. As a ZMC fracture segment moves in towards the orbit, it crushes in along the orbital floor, sometimes including the median orbit, to create a large orbital floor defect through which the globe itself can fall into the maxillary sinus, causing hypoglobus, or fall back posteriorly, causing inophthalmus. With significant displacement, as orbital edema resolves, this can lead to a problematic diplopia that requires surgical intervention. In this situation, you're going to still proceed with the ZMC repair using the lateral brow, intraoral incision, and plate across the fracture lines as you normally would, and then address the orbital floor using transconjunctival incision. If you have a very large implant, you may require lateral canthotomy to fit it through the incision. If you have a very large medial orbital wall defect that requires also reconstruction, they can consider a transcurrencular approach. Once you have the orbital floor exposed, you're then gonna consider placing an orbital floor implant of your choice, I'll typically use a medport titanium orbital floor implant. In situations where a patient has a significant proptosis or severe orbital trauma, such as retrobulbar hematoma, I'll typically stage the orbital floor reconstruction to minimize potential for any ocular injuries. And also, once the orbital edema improves about a one week out after the incident, it makes the orbital floor implant placement that much easier. In type 6, you have a ZMC fracture that results in orbital apex syndrome. In this very rare type of fracture pattern, your ZMC fracture gets displaced into the orbit. It will then push up against the greater ring of sphenoid, which then gets displaced medially up against the superior orbital fissure, as well as posteriorly against the temporal lobe. 
And within superior of fissure, you have creating nerve three, four, five, and six traveling. And as a result, aside from the sensory issues, you have paralysis of ocular motor function in all directions. When this occurs in the absence of visual disturbance, this constitutes superorbital fissure syndrome. If you have superorbital fissure syndrome occurring along with visual disturbance, this constitutes orbital apex syndrome. Within optic canal, which is located medial to the superorbital fissure, you have optic nerve that's responsible for vision. Fracture occurring along the optic canal or bone compression of the optic nerve itself can lead to blindness. If visual disturbance occurs in the absence of fracture of the optic canal, this could be from the traction injury to the optic nerve. This type of injury occurs from high-speed blunt trauma. As such, the ZMC repair will be more difficult than usual. Your focus will primarily be on the ZMC fracture repair first, and you'll gain access by using lateral brow incision, intraoral maxillary vestibular approach, and transconjunctival approach with lateral canthotomy. Through this incision, you'll gain adequate access to the infraorbital rim, which may be fractured badly. And more importantly, you'll be using this approach to gain adequate access to the orbit. Your first priority is to lift the malar eminence segment of the ZMC fracture to its proper alignment. Your next focus is to decompress the superorbital fissure. You can gain exposure by using the transconjunctival incision with lateral canthotomy and performing subperiosteal dissection along the lateral orbital rim until the superorbital fissure is reached. Having an intraoperative CT scan may help you identify the problematic bone fragment and also to see if you're properly reducing it. More likely, you'll have very difficult time reducing the bone fragment into proper alignment. As such, using a drill or ultrasonic instrument such as Sonopet to melt away the problematic bone fragment may provide adequate decompression of the orbital apex. In a particular patient that I had, it resulted in full return of ocular motor function three to four weeks after the initial decompression. Once you have satisfactory decompression of the orbital apex, you can then proceed with plating the ZMC fracture as you normally would. In respect to the orbital floor repair, it's best reconstructed in a staged fashion when the orbital edema has fully resolved. Thank you for watching.